So this is part one of our immune response lecture series. So in this video, we're going to discuss the physical and chemical barriers that pathogens need to overcome to cause an immune response. Before we start looking at that, let's have a look at the relevant inquiry question. This is under module seven, infectious disease, and the particular inquiry question is immunity and how the immune system responds to a pathogen. Make sure you understand what a pathogen is. A pathogen is simply just an infectious agent. The reason we don't call a pathogen a cell is because there are many small particles and molecules that can act as a pathogen and cause disease. An example is prions. They're simply just proteins, a sequence of amino acids that is capable of causing one of the worst neurological diseases known to mankind. Prion diseases invariably result in death. So important to realize, although those cases like prions are quite rare, pathogens do not have to be living. So we're going to go through how your immune system knows to respond to a pathogen, and it knows to tolerate yourself and all the tissues and cells that make you up. Now, interesting fact, every single one of your body cells is outnumbered 10 to 1 by the bacteria on your body right now. You are, in fact, much more bacteria than you are human. So it's important to understand how we interact with that bacteria that makes up our microbiota and how we control our response to it and how we respond specifically to pathogens. The immune system is one of the most interesting concepts in science. And that's because it's a very coordinated, beautiful response, which saves lives. And if we understand it better, we can possibly develop better treatments and prevention methods to save lives in the future. So we're going to start with the ABCs of the immune system. What is an antigen and what is an antibody? The way I like to remember it is an antigen. The word gen stands for generating an immune response. That's how I want you to remember it. So an antigen is simply a molecule that is capable of generating an immune response. And for now, when I say immune response, all I want you to understand is white blood cells, which are a specific kind of policing cell in the body. They look around for pathogens, will come to a site, and they'll cause some kind of response. So they respond to antigens. So these are marker molecules, and you can see them right here. There's different shapes and there's different sizes. Point being, antigens can be anything. If you go to a garden and you prick your thumb with a thorn, the thorn contains foreign molecules. Those foreign molecules are recognized as foreign antigens, and hence you mount an immune response and your thumb gets red hot and swollen. Some of you might have hay fever, and that's simply just an immune response to ryegrass. That doesn't cause disease, but your immune system doesn't know that. So the hallmark here is that your immune system responds to foreign antigens, and it tolerates self. So unlike antigens, antibodies are very specific. They can't be any molecule. Antigens include every single substance in the entire universe. Everything that makes you up is a self-antigen. Everything that makes the rest of the universe up is a foreign antigen. And if that pierces your skin or gets into your body, you generate an immune response. Contrastingly, antibodies can only be one type of molecule. They can only be proteins. So all antibodies, all of these Y-shaped molecules you see are proteins, meaning they're chains of amino acids. Another term we have for the word antibody is immunoglobulin. That is why you see an Ig next to all of the different antibody classes. Antibodies are also called immunoglobulins. So these are proteins, they're not cells. And you have to understand antibodies are immune proteins you make to foreign antigens. So here are some foreign antigens. And you can see on the Y-shaped antibody, it's this antigen binding site that actually binds to the antigen. And once it binds, you simply have to understand it's immobilized here. Can you see that? This foreign antigen, imagine if it was a bacterial toxin, now cannot act and bind to a cell and cause disease. 
So the key here is antibodies don't kill anything. They simply bind to it and immobilize it and neutralize it. So I like to have this analogy where I think of white blood cells as police officers, which go out and do surveillance and they eliminate any unwanted or deleterious agents. Your antibodies are like the handcuffs that they use to immobilize a foreign invader. Here is an electron micrograph of an antibody. You can see all the ridges here. This just represents the irregularity of the polypeptide chain. As you recall, they're made out of proteins. So we've already gone through this, that antibodies and antigens exist in pairs. And what I mean by that is for every single foreign antigen, I want you to imagine, for example, your laptop, the metal that makes your laptop up, the plastic that makes up your mouse. Those are all foreign antigens. They're outside your body. Your body has a specific complementary antibody to that antigen. Meaning, if someone were to stab you with the metal of the laptop, for example, you will produce a specific immune protein that responds and immobilizes to that metal piece. So every single antibody is married, you could almost think of, to a specific antigen. Now, we've already gone through the different classes, and you don't need to understand what the different classes are. This key here is simply that IgM antibodies, this pentameric shape you see, is the first class of antibody to be produced by the immune system. After you've already seen a pathogen, your immune system has this beautiful capacity to memorize things. It remembers past diseases. And what it does is it upgrades the handcuffs or the antibodies it uses. So it switches from this naive IgM handcuff to a more effective IgG handcuff. Recall, the word Ig simply stands for immunoglobulin. Right, so here are some interesting images so you can actually appreciate the beauty of the immune response. Here is a tumor cell. Now, one in three people by the age of 85 will develop cancer, which is very unfortunate. And you can see here that white blood cells from the bloodstream are responding to this cancer cell. The way they know to not attack all of this white tissue here, which is self antigen and your body, and they know to only react to the cancer cell is they look for foreign antigens. Your immune response is one of the most powerful defenses against cancer. And we often manipulate that in treatments for cancer therapy. Now here you can see a vast amount of antibodies being produced to a particular pathogen. Now this looks almost like a virus. This could be the, the lipid envelope of the virus. And you can see the amount of antibodies being produced. Since you see the Y shape here, you know these are IgG antibodies, not IgM. So this would be a secondary response to a particular virus. Now we're gonna go through the three lines of defense. And this is how I like to think of the immune response. It's not this simple in real life. They often blend with one another in this complex coordinated response. But for the HCC, you can think of it as three barriers that a pathogen needs to overcome to eventually kill an organism. The first line of defense, I like to think of it as the walls of the castle. So if you have a castle, you have walls. Inside the wall, you have soldiers which defend the general settlement. And past that, you have your special forces, which we're going to get to. Now, obviously, if you overcome all three levels, then the vulnerable individuals, the cells that make you up, will succumb to infection and the overall organism will die. But often, pathogens can't even get past this first barrier. We're going to go through what makes this up. So you can see here, there are multiple different physical and chemical barriers in the immune response. The way I like to understand it is I simply go through the human body. So you can see from mouth all the way to intestines and out the urethra, you have all of these physical chemical barriers. Now, 
I like to close my eyes and take myself through a journey of all the passages of the body to appreciate all the physical and chemical barriers. So I don't want you to memorize this. Simply appreciate everything that's going on to keep disease out of your body. So right now your skin microflora, so the bacteria on your skin is outnumbering your own body cells 10 to one. You are 10 times more bacteria than you are human cells. This is a pretty unsettling concept, but a lot of the bacteria are doing good. A few of them can cause disease and hence we call them pathogens. They must overcome all of these barriers before they can settle into tissue and actually cause disease and generate an immune response. So I want you to imagine you inhale air and there are some airborne bacteria, bacteria that are floating in the air that have now gotten into your nose and your mouth. Now straight away, your nose and your mouth has these hair-like structures here and they're beating rapidly upwards. They're kind of like an elevator that brings everything back to the top floor. So all the pathogens that make it down this respiratory tree, down these bronchi, these two tubes and into the lungs will get kicked all the way back up here and they'll be coughed or sneezed out. These hair-like projections are called cilia and they're one of the most effective physical barriers to disease. Another physical barrier is the mucus. So if an army were trying to invade your body, one of the most unsettling things you could do is to create a bog or a swamp-like environment where the invaders can't move down anymore. That is exactly what the mucus does. It acts like a swamp or a bog which prevents movement of the bacteria or the pathogen down the respiratory tree. So cilia and mucus work together as physical barriers against pathogens. In fact, the most important physical barrier you must say in your exams is the largest organ in the body, and that is your skin. Your skin consists of dead cells, so it's very difficult for a pathogen to actually infect it. On top of that, your skin has a layer of armor. You can't see it, but it's laced in the same protein that makes your nails. It's called keratin. So we can call skin cells dead keratinized cells. And they prevent against any toxins permeating through the body or against any pathogens themselves. Now, if you make it down the mouth and the throat, and let's say you make it down this tube, the esophagus, and you get to the stomach, the stomach has strong concentrated hydrochloric acid. So it has approximate pH of two, and that's straight away going to destroy all pathogens. So stomach bugs must be able to overcome this very low pH. So only very few select bacteria, viruses, and other pathogens can do that. The most common stomach bug is actually a virus. It's called a rotavirus and norovirus. So coming down here, as soon as you jump out of the stomach, you get to this very alkaline conditions, meaning it's very basic. Now, being basic is also bad because bases can also destroy the cell membrane, the cell walls of a pathogen. The reason it's basic is because of bile released by the gallbladder. But the overall thing you need to understand is a basic environment also destroys pathogens. Good. And that's a brief overview of all the chemical and physical barriers. I've listed them here so you can go through that in your own time. And this is a comprehensive overview of all the physical and chemical barriers. The one barrier I have not mentioned, this is a chemical barrier, is IgA. So coming back up here, you can see IgA. It has this weird antibody structure. It's like, almost like a double conjoined Y. I think of IgA as a booby trap. And on top of the swamp, which is your mucus, which protects against invaders, you also have little booby traps in the swamp. That's your IgA. They're sitting deep in the respiratory tract. And when a pathogen encounters it or binds to the IgA, it will lock that pathogen up. So almost like a trap that's trapping a particular invader and preventing them from moving. And it's one of the most powerful chemical barriers in the respiratory tract. And that concludes our lesson on physical and chemical barriers and an overview of the immune response.